I've had the opportunity to teach uh, a class at Utah State University in the Instructional Technology and Learning Sciences Department since 2001. It was the second fully online class that the department offered. It's an HTML, CSS, JavaScript, but as you can imagine, back in 2001, there wasn't CSS and, and stuff. So it's evolved over the years. And so at, at that time, I was an instructional designer at Utah State University and also had the opportunity to to, to teach the class, and as you can imagine with the evolving technology of, of HTML, right? I was changing textbooks and having to retool even my own knowledge uh, every couple of years, and sometimes the textbooks were just not keeping up. So for years I've wanted to move away from the textbook, and because how many HTML resources, at least in you know, my field, HTML resources are out on the web, right? Billions, right? Uh, there's, there's a lot out there, and I've always wanted to do that, but I, I never could quite pull myself to make the plunge. And there were, there were various uh, reasons for that. Um, this is the textbook I used until uh, uh, a year ago, and then last fall was the first semester that I went without the textbook. You can see the cost on Amazon. I looked it up before I came. It's now at $97.27. It started at $80 two years ago, and it, it's on its third edition already. Um, and the digital rental is actually quite affordable. It's actually dropped in price uh, down to $41.99, right? Um, the course attracts students from a wide variety of majors. And so that's been a very interesting thing because they come with various prerequisite knowledge or lack of prerequisite no knowledge. The book is actually very, very good. I love this book because it's, uh, uh, and students love it because it's hands-on and it does step-by-step -step and it has great case studies that build upon. And that was key to my, the success of my class is students uh, learned little building blocks and then each week I had weekly lessons and modules that they had to complete. They'd go through the textbook, the textbook would take them step-by-step. -step. Then there'd be a case study at the end that would build upon the case study from the time before. So, uh, and I always tell students that regardless of their major, this looks great on the resume and it can help you get that job. I've even got students who are now working for an instructor that always come up to me and tell me that, hey, your class is the reason I'm able to get to do what I'm doing. And they, they, they've been in various majors from marketing to uh, technical writing and things like that. Okay. And uh, just a little bit more about the class, the final project is a portfolio piece. All right. So before I came, one of the reasons that I ditched the textbook was just the cost of textbooks. I now have children of my own entering college. And I'm helping them pay for those textbooks. So I'm getting an eye opener at really what textbooks cost, folks. Okay? I wasn't as conscious before, but I am. And even in my own class, you know, a lot of people were saying, you know, students are really liking these digital textbooks, right? So I did a survey using Canvas and on the, the uh, quiz tool, but as an anonymous survey in my class. I did it for several for two years, and I would ask students. I had the question. I don't remember the exact wording of the question. But it was something to the, you know, check which most applies to you. I buy the hard copy textbook, or I, or I prefer a hard copy textbook, I prefer a digital textbook, but, or I prefer a hard copy textbook, but often buy the digital textbook because it's cheaper. The, the, that was basically the three questions. And guess what the highest majority of it was? Want to take a guess? Yeah. I buy the digital tech, I prefer the hard copy textbook, but I often buy the digital copy because of price. Okay? And, I, and I haven't done that this last year, asked that question, because I believe trends change as we get, you know, students come in that are more used to digital assets. I still prefer hard copy in many cases. I still like a book. Maybe that's because I grew up, that's the way I grew up. And I see a lot of students in my class, they love the hard copy because they have the book here, they have the computer here, right? And so they're flipping through. I have seen some students now with the tablets on the laptop. They have the tablet with the book. They have the laptop here doing the assignment. So it's something to watch and it's something to pay attention to. Uh, you know, the trend may be that everybody's going to the digital textbook, but it may not be what the students really, really prefer. But, and we do know that there are students going without the textbooks in our courses, right? Okay. So I, did, I just walked around the bookstore about a week ago, and Neil Legler gave me this idea. He's one of my colleagues at Utah State. And I, so I walked around, and I just snapped some basic photos of books. So here's a C++ book, right? 150 bucks. You can get it. The e-book rental's 55. 
All right, here's a small book uh, that's a research methods for generalists, $170.95 new, okay? Um, here's a sign in our bookstore, save money, rent your books, right? It's kind of like the lease model of cars, right? They got so expensive, so we had to come up with other ways to be able to have uh, people afford them, and so that rent your book. And I'm actually telling my own kids who are going to college, rent your books, right? Don't buy them. Uh, Anyway, here's one. Here's a differential equations in linear algebra. In my mind, how often does this kind of field change, right? Um, it's $189, okay? Uh, look at this one, discovering English grammar. It, this is a small one, $159.95 for this class. But I've got to read you what this says. I opened this book and read the introduction. This is funny. And I know what they're trying to get at, but I don't know if you can read it, but I will. The purpose of this book is to reveal to you Something you already know. <laughs> okay? All right, this was the most expensive one I found, in, and I'm sure there were more expensive ones than this. I, I know in the engineering fields, right? Our bookstore was kind of in the in between getting the new books in, and a lot of stuff wasn't there. This was $244.95. Yeah, that's what it feels like, right? But there is hope. There is hope. Look what I found surviving debt book. Guess how much this one is. Take, take a guess. $25.95. Probably the most important one for a college student going to college, right? We won't get into the, the, the tuition debate because it's all part of that as well. So a little bit of fun there, but um, that. All right. So I want to open this discussion up. So when you, when you, Abandon a, not abandon a textbook, but take on open educational resources of stuff you can find or stuff you create. There are both challenges and opportunities. And I know some of you have already probably crossed this path, probably have better ideas than me, but I wanted to open this up for ideas. What are some of the challenges that you see when either you're a, you're a faculty member that wants to go this way or you're an instructional designer trying to help a faculty go this way? Uh, Please, we've got a microphone. Where's the mic? Okay, just speak up loud and I'll, uh, I'll just repeat what you say. Legal contracts with the bookstore prevented. Oh, so you have some legal contracts. Prevent faculty for, from adopting open educational resources? Wow. Okay, there was another hand. That's an interesting challenge I hadn't even thought of. Too many resources, that was my problem. Too many resources in one area. It's kind of like adopt, I, I liken it, you know when you adopt a textbook, right? You have to go find out which publishers have these. You ask them to send them to you, right? Now you can get them digitally a lot of times. I still ask them to send me a physical one uh, and they give me access to do it. And you have to kind of vet them and sort through them, right? But yes, too many resources in some fields. That's an excellent challenge. Others, yes? Yeah, find something really, really great on a website and the next semester it's gone. Another issue is it, it doesn't work. So was there somebody else? Yes? Accessibility. Oh, yeah, good one. Well, yeah, accessibility. Lack of standardization across disciplines. All kinds of different professors teaching the same class, but all using different textbooks. Yeah, lack of standards. I've, I've actually seen students gravitate towards a class because the textbook was cheaper for that class than another class. I believe that, that, that students do gravitate to classes based on a cheaper textbook. And the other comment was lack of standardization. Yes? Peer review and quality review. You don't exactly know what you got open sometimes. Exactly. You don't know if peer review and quality review, right? It takes a lot of time to vet resources. It takes, in my opinion, it takes a lot of time to vet a new textbook. I don't know how many textbooks every couple of years I've, I've you know, requested and then going through them. And, and in some cases, I've got to go through my objectives and what my outcomes I want these students to come with, and does this textbook cover it, and what doesn't it? That's, that's time consuming even at the textbook level. Anybody else on a challenge before we move to opportunities? Have another thought. Okay, opportunities. Let's talk about opportunities. Price, okay. For the, the student, you think about if I save 40 students a semester, $97, right? Okay, it, it can add up, and especially in Gen Ed, if we're talking that international business book at $249. So price, definitely. Oh, yes, 
leveraging resources, your institutional already licenses. I've heard from, a, from several people that, you know, the faculty will put a course text together and they go through copyright clearance, they put it in the bookstore, the students buy it, but yet the library already had that resource licensed, right? They could have just linked it in. Okay. Other opportunities? Uh, the ability to customize. The ability to customize, yes. Yeah, no, no need to buy a new edition when they change a picture in the textbook, yes. <laughs> okay, other opportunities. It allows you to have relevant, up-to-date information. Yeah, that was the challenge in, with textbooks in mind, stuff's evolving. I, even though I was using the textbook, I did have a couple of units that I, I didn't even tell what the students were going to be because I didn't even know what they were going to be, right? They were going to be new and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, what's, what's on the frontier. Other opportunities. Markup, searchability, and the portability of it. Yes. Did you? Okay, right here. If in fact it's a genuine OER, then you have the statutory right by license to adapt and tweak and move and change and extract as well. Yeah, if it's truly OER, we have the license to adapt it, change it, add to it, right? Yeah, make it better, scaffold it. Okay. One last comment on this before we move on. Anybody else have a thought on opportunities? Yes. Variety, right? Yeah. So let me tell you a bit about the approach I personally took through this, all right? My first thought was somebody's already has this figured out, right? There's got to be tons of these HTML classes. So I tweeted, I posted on Facebook, I got no response from, you know, I says, anybody know of a, somebody using an OER site for teaching this class? I got no response, but maybe my reach isn't all that great, okay? That was my first thought. Okay, then I had to decide, am I going to create my own or find something that already exists? And even in my textbook, I had supporting videos. Uh, the next thought was, I went to Google, right? And I just started Googling. And I already had some ideas of what was out there. And then I had to compare it against objectives and outcomes, look for issues, make up my mind, and that's the hardest part. I have a hard time adopting a textbook, right? Because they're they're all kind of, well, it's not quite, well, it's, you know, and finding the best one that met it, and then dive in. So, in my, um, what I learned from this, okay, this is from my experience, and if you want to disagree with me and do it vocally, please do, okay, if you've got experience with it. But this is my, what I learned. It took the same amount of effort as adopting a new textbook to find the resources I wanted to use, okay. I still had to go out and find which publishers had textbooks, what was there, even off-the-shelf books. I had to request them, I had to compare it, I had to do that. Lots of indecision, because anyway. Uh, none contained everything I wanted, would need to, to find additional resources or create my own. Uh, this is what was missing. The textbook I was using had case studies and hands-on exercise that build upon each other, right? Textbooks are good at, org I mean, they spend a lot of money and they have great people who can take those. And then they have, like, if you have um, courses where you have to have test banks, right? I mean, they have wonderful test banks. And when you go to OER in many cases and webs, that all shifts that burden to you, right? Now, there are some uh, open textbook sites um, that are out there that people are, you know, creating these. There's various initiatives, and I'd like to get your input on what's out there that you could, you could help us understand what's there. So the open content I chose, Code Academy, had great hands-on exercise. Remember the, the first slide that students love the textbook. I got excellent feedback from students about the textbook. Um, I found out after, I thought it, I had everything covered and I'd built content, but at the end of the semester as we went through it, I found gaps that I thought were there that weren't. And I went, oh yeah, oh yeah. So this second semester, which was spring, I actually found additional resources to continue to add to it, okay? Um, that was the, you know, I had to find other resources. That was the time, that was the time consuming part, okay? All right. So, so that's it. I don't know if you've seen Code Academy. I've got it, I've got it open here. I just wanted to show you what's kind of cool about it, at least here. And the student feedback from this, my, my student evaluations have not changed. Uh, they're still good. Uh, they love Code Academy. All right. And as I've used Code Academy, I don't, it, it's got some serious gaps in my mind. But the thing that students love about it, kind of like that textbook, was that it took you step by step. So this one right here, let's add a head and title to your web page. So you, I've already done it. You come up here and you, you actually type your text and you save it and you submit it, okay? 
and it says way to go, and then you go to the next lesson, and you read a little bit, and it tells you what to do, and uh, underneath the closing tag you do it, you hit, I've already done this, so that's why it says congratulations, you've been it. But anyway, students love this because it was very hands-on and they got feedback immediately. So it made the class um, very usable for me, but what it lacked was building a project. So I had to come up with projects like a midterm and a final project that they, that they could do that was uh, more appropriate. All right, so the last part of this, we're at 11.15, is I wanted, I wanted to pick on you, because I'm no expert, to contribute to uh, what, where are good sources to find OER? What, besides going to Google, what have you found that's been valuable when trying to help faculty or yourself find OER? Two sites, OpenStax College. OpenStax College. Rice University is the one that sponsors that. Rice Open University. Good stuff. Let's yep. get that microphone moving for this part, can we? That would be great. Yep. The other one is OER Commons, and they have everything from history to biology. So OER Commons, everything from history to biology. Thank you for those. Others? Raise your hands. Anybody else have any? Merlot. Merlot? Okay. Um, I was going to say Merlot is a great resource. You can also use uh, archive.org. Um, it's not necessarily textbooks, but it has a lot of resources like um, videos and um, initial documents, stuff like that, that you can use to supplement whatever you're building to fill the gaps on Okay. So that was like archive.org. Go. Yeah. And then we'll come back to, to the... Um, well, I teach nutrition, and so a lot of my resources come from the American Dietetics Association, American Heart Association, also the NIH, uh, PubMed. So those are some of the resources I use. So it's kind of subject-specific resources. Right. Good. There was a hand back there, Tara. We're going to keep Tara running here. <laughs> So um, I have two suggestions. One is um, using the Creative Commons search engine. Um, that's a, a great way to get a lot of different content, either from Wikimedia, via images, text, videos, everything like that. I've used that personally. And also, um, I'm going to keep plugging the library, because especially our librarians are very, uh, at UCF, are, are very into the open movement. And they're, they're able to say, hey, either we have it, or it's out there, or kind of point you in the right direction. I like that one about the library. I hadn't even thought of that, and somebody brought that to my light. We have one of our, our librarians here from Utah State University is, yeah, you have subject matter experts at your libraries in most cases, right, depending on the size of your school. They're out there, for the most part, looking for these kind of stuff. They can be a, a big help to you, so and, yes. And, and they can also tell you if anybody else in your department is looking at the same thing, so maybe you can tag team a, a book. You won't find out about it at faculty meeting, but the librarian will know, huh? <laughs> All right, we got a hand right up here, Tara. Uh, what was his, your first suggestion? Oh, Creative Commons, yeah, that's right. Okay. George? I was just going to say that uh, on YouTube, there's some um, aggregators of public domain films and um, in, in particular, like I was looking for some information on uh, pesticide training, and the films that I found, you know, they're from the 70s, 80s, 90s, but when you're doing a two, three, four minute clip, you know, you can make that work for you. So there's a, a lot of that that's been kind of tracked down and, and brought together. Yeah, good, good point. I, and you jarred a memory. A couple weeks ago, I got this email from somebody who was using my class to teach a community at a library he had a community class he was teaching. He was a retired IT director on how to build web pages, and he had found my class. I'm going, how did he find my class? But I had forgotten early on, Canvas used my class as an example of, of, a, of a class in Canvas, and so it's open, and I can't remember where it's at. Well, he had the URL, and I went to it, and there's my class from two years ago that's available to people, and he had found it and was using it to teach a community class, right? So. Uh, Anyway, any, anybody else have ideas? I'm a librarian too, so this will be a little loaded. Um, yeah, the library is good, one good place, but there's other places as well. Uh, there are five states around the country that have open access mandates, Oregon, California, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, 
I think Washington too, right? Is it Washington? Washington uh, British an open Columbia textbook. has one. Um, there's also, I mean, don't dismiss YouTube. There's a lot of older stuff there, but there's newer material as well. And then uh, through Wikimedia Commons, there's a lot of material that you can pick up, both illustrations, code, definitions, and all kinds of stuff that's available as well. Okay. Yeah, there's some, I have not explored those open textbook <laughs> initiatives yet. I know they're there. Has anybody else ex started to explore them at your, your campus? The University of Minnesota has a great open textbook um, website that they're building. Hmm. Cool. University of Minnesota, that's great. All right. <coughs> Other thoughts? I, oh, back there. I actually have a question. You bet. Um, in building a course for this semester, I actually used some YouTube videos. Um, it was a JetBlue video about their recruiting. It was human resource class. Um, and in the two or three week time period from the time I had uploaded until the class actually started, they had made that, that video private. So, you know, rather than my depending on that, how can you know, or is there a way to know if, yeah. you know, if that's some, an individual? Um, so I had to scramble and find additional, you know, another source to, to illustrate the point I was trying to make. Yeah, and that was one of the challenges brought up. Was it you that brought up that challenge where, you know, making sure your links all work at the start of the semester? So, Neil, would those link checkers work in this case? If we embedded a YouTube video from YouTube, it probably wouldn't work, right? Because the link's still there. The link's still there. Yeah. The link's still there. There's some creative folks out there. Our school's done it, and we saw another uh, college or university that has done it. There's built link checkers using the LTI or APIs to go in and you know, scrub out links and pages and test them. That can be a huge advantage. But in this case, I don't think it would have worked because you would go there and it would, it would yeah. There's a YouTube API, maybe? Well, there is a YouTube API. I might, right. I might have the ability to check for the API. Yeah, yeah. The, the, his suggestion is maybe there's a YouTube API that we can scour, but not available today. Anybody have a, a, an answer, additional thought on that? Yeah, YouTube downloaders. That's how we put that grease clip in, it was with the YouTube downloader, right? Yeah, and um, I don't know about the copyright. That's not a good idea. Well, yeah. I've downloaded it just in case and still linked to it. Uh, okay. So a comment is I downloaded it just in case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, as well. Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole thing, you know, and I've always thought, well, if you use YouTube videos, do you have the legal right really to embed them in your class? In my opinion, YouTube provides that play thing that says embed, right? Or share or link or whatever. I figure you do. Um, I teach English at the seventh grade level, and there's a lot of like introductory YouTube videos that I have downloaded because you can never trust your internet connection in public schools. And then um, sometimes I back them up to a Google Drive or a YouTube, not not YouTube, a Dropbox account, mm. and that somehow because you can link to Dropbox and all that, so that's some way. I know probably legality, maybe not. So yeah, much, but. my course has several YouTube videos that I've. I've linked to, and then I've created some YouTube videos that I have put on YouTube and linked to my class. I now want to add those videos that are out on YouTube into Commons, and that's one of the things I hope we'll see with Commons is, yeah, you can curate the, the stuff that you create, right, and put in Commons, but I also want a place that I can, when I go out and find good OER resources that I might want to use in my classes, I would like them to go, be able to somehow put them in Commons. They may not physically be there, but some sort of link, right? and embed to that YouTube video I found, have it in common so I can easily grab it and include it in my class without having to go back to these resource sites. For the K-12 folks among us, if, if um, I like uh, CK-12, and it's a, um, based out of California nonprofit organization, but it's geared for the K-12 crowd, not necessarily the university. But. Good, thank you. See? I came here to learn from you. This whole presentation was about getting learning from you. Even for going for uh, just iTunes U, they've got some structural things. <laughs> they've got, right. we'll just throw it up there. 
They've got some structural things where you could go in and see the way that they formatted some and pull from their clips and, and link them that way. Wow, um, so iTunes U. iTunes U. I wouldn't run a whole class that way, but it's a, it's a good resource. Yeah, we experimented with iTunes U early on, and our, our, I didn't realize you could, could do that, but uh, pull those things. But yeah, the, the, the whole proprietary thing of it for access, right, just made it not as glamorous as it, we first thought it would be, right, to, to work. But yes, good. All right, we got, a, we got one back here, too. And then we're going to go to just general questions. We've got like four minutes. Uh, I was just going to say, um, when you're, you're thinking about resources and, and kind of uh, aggregating everything, um, think about going back to your example with the algebra book that hasn't changed, you know, in the last 50, 100 years. Think about what core... The pictures have. The pictures have, of course. But those are easy to replace uh, with this model. But think about the, that core curriculum of your course that pre is pretty stable. And you probably want to own that, download that, keep that in your platform. And then being able to plug and play different pieces that are easily updatable. And if a YouTube link goes down or something like that, it, it's something... Uh, easier to uh, find and, and replace. Yeah, thank you. All right, general questions or uh, something that's on your mind that... Uh, Mark. Um, our college has made a major commitment to make sure that every single piece of media is cl closed captioned and, and that. So we're trying to do the OER thing, but we're finding videos that are really useful that maybe another faculty member's made, and then, but they haven't captioned them. So we'll even offer to do the captioning for them, and some people don't even want us to do that. You know, we'll get you the caption file if you'll just put it up in YouTube. And so that's that's been kind of a challenge. And uh, in the OER world, is some of our own rules and policies, things we want to do, getting the uh, OER sources to to be able to use them that way. So. Thank you for sharing Specifically that. captioning as well. Yeah, that, that is. That's a constant thing. And I know in the video days, because I came from a video environment, it was legal for you. If you had, a, had access to a copy of a movie or whatever and it wasn't captioned, you could actually physically copy that movie to provide accessibilities uh, or to provide an accessible version, whether it was captioned or audio described or whatever, and not break any copyright laws. I don't know how that applies to the digital media world, though. Alt tags yeah. on pictures. Yeah, so that's another yep. thing to think about. Cool. Thank you. We got one more, and then we're probably done. Uh, an ad admonition for policy: If you go to an inst if you work at a public institution, there's no reason why you can't push for a policy that goes through that says, if the faculty are going to get grant money from the campus, if they're going to do part of work, that they should think about licensing or at least licensing on campus so that it's shareable otherwise. Copyright isn't intended, it isn't intended to lock stuff up forever. It's there to share. That's the beauty of Creative Commons, too. So you can put a Creative Commons license in the thing that you do and send it anywhere you want to. Thank you. That's excellent. All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>